Well, hello, it's good to be back with you again. I've been spending my time away by finishing up school, working, and researching as much as I can about the incredible Anabaptists. And recently, I've been working on a very in-depth how to write documentary. But while I was wrapping up my research for that documentary, I kept coming across these horrific events that were happening to the Hutterites by the American authorities during World War I. So I wanted to create the separate video where we can go in depth on these horrific events that were inflicted on the Hutterites by the American authorities. And once my Hutterite documentary has been released, I'll put it right here. I hope you enjoy this video. Since their arrival to America in the 1870s, the Hutterites have kept a very low profile. They kept their heads down and worked hard on their isolated farms in South Dakota, remaining completely separated from the rest of the American population. By the time America had entered World War I in 1917, the Hutterites had become fairly prosperous. Their population had grown from around 450 in 1879 to 2000 in 1917, living in 19 colonies, 17 in South Dakota and 2 in Montana. The Mennonites and Hutterites had been welcomed kindly by America, who wanted them to settle the western land masses, which were very vast and very empty. However, this kindness towards the Hutterites turned very sour when America entered World War I. On the 18th of May, 1917, the Selective Sendee Act was passed, mandating that all physically abled boys between the ages of 21 and 31 be liable and register for military service. This presented a serious problem for the pacifist Hutterites, who practiced non-resistance. In August 1917, the Hutterite colony sent a delegation to Washington, D.C., in hopes of presenting their concerns of compulsory military service to President Wilson in hopes of getting a military exemption, such as the ones they had received earlier in Transylvania and in Russia. Unfortunately, they did not get a meeting with President Wilson, but they did get a meeting with the Secretary of War, Newton Baker. Baker advised the Hutterites to send their drafted boys to their designated induction centers, but once there, for the Hutterite boys to, quote, do what their conscience would allow them to do, end quote but Baker could not make any promises to the Hutterite delegation. But nevertheless, the Hutterites listened to Baker's advice, and before the first Hutterite boys were drafted into military service, the colony leaders had mutually agreed that the drafted Hutterite boys should go to the induction center, but once there, they were to be completely uncooperative. This means that the Hutterite boys were to refuse to wear any military uniform whatsoever, and were also not to comply with any commands where they would be assisting the war effort in any way. Unfortunately, this non-compliance will pave the way for appalling outcomes for these drafted Hutterite boys after they arrived at the induction centers. John Unruh wrote in his essay, The Hutterites During World War I, that, from available records, it would appear that some 50 Hutterite men were drafted into service. Quite a few of these men were married at the time, some having as many as four children. When the Hutterite boys would arrive at these induction centers, the military officers would make it their personal mission to go after these boys and try and break them into complying with the military service. And they would try and achieve this by doing physical torture and psychological torture. According to John Hostetler in Hutterite Society, at Camp Houston, some of the Hutterites were brutally handled in the guardhouse, where they were bayoneted, beaten, and tortured with various forms of water torture. In Jacob S. Waldner's diary, who was one of these drafted Hutterites, he writes of many horrible experiences at Camp Houston, some of which include being thrown into icy showers and then tossed out of a window where other guards were waiting for them. These guards would grab the Hutterites by the beards and drag them around on the ground. They would also cut the Hutterites' beards and disfigure them to try and make them look as ridiculous as possible. On one occasion, 18 men were awakened at night and thrown into cold icy showers, while others were hung by their feet above tanks of water until they were on the verge of drowning to death. The boys were also chased in the fields by guards on motorcycles under the guise of performing exercise. 
Now this inhumane treatment that the Hutterite boys were facing was not exclusively inflicted upon the Hutterites, it was inflicted upon all conscientious objectors, including the Mennonites. However, it does seem to be the case that the Hutterites were the most strict in their collective refusal of obeying these commands. Jacob S. Waldner provided a written statement to his captain at Camp Fuston when he refused to work. I am against being persuaded to take part in any military services that President Wilson has outlined as non-combative service. The reason for this is because I am a member of the Hutterian Brethren Church, whose creed forbids taking part in any form of military service. The officers would also talk amongst the Hutterites and try to get them to verbally trip up into contradicting their own non-resistance positions. And this is exactly why, when Paul Kleinsasser was asked why the Hutterites did not bend just a little bit, Paul said, If we had bent even just a trifle, our whole case would have been broken. But conscientious objectors who did comply with their military orders, such as working small, menial tasks around camp, received much better treatment than those who strictly refused. And the Hutterites do seem to be the ones who always refuse to comply. Interestingly, Unruh writes that the Hutterites felt that the Mennonites had often compromised too much. And this brings us to our most tragic story that we'll cover in this video, which is about the four Hutterite boys who were drafted into the military from the Wolf Creek Colony in South Dakota. These four boys consisted of Jacob Whitth and three brothers, Jacob, David, and Michael Hoffer. They left their home in early July 1918 and went to Fort Lewis in Washington, where they refused to sign the required papers and refused to put on the army uniform. As punishment, the four boys were put in the guardhouse, and after two months of that, they were sentenced to 37 years in prison for their non-compliance. And they were taken to Alcatraz, which is the famous military island prison in San Francisco Bay. According to John Hostetler, in Alcatraz, the four Hutterite boys were watched over by four armed lieutenants, who kept them handcuffed during the day and chained by the ankles to each other at night. It's so crazy because you can imagine inside Alcatraz all these horrible, hardened, murderous, crazy criminals, and then there's these four non-resistant pacifist boys who are simply conscientious objectors to the war basically getting the same treatment as these hardened criminals. But then, as we'll see next, the Hutterite boys get even worse treatment than the other prisoners in Alcatraz. In Alcatraz, the Hutterites were given another chance to put on the US military uniform, but again, the four boys refused. As punishment, they were taken to the dungeon and put into solitary confinement, where the boys were within earshot of each other. John Hostetler writes of this dungeon as being dark filthy and full of stench. The guard placed an army uniform in each of their solitary confinement cells and said that they would each stay here until they died. And for four days, they slept on the cold, wet concrete floor wearing nothing but their light underwear. They received half a glass of water every 24 hours, but no food, so they were on a starvation diet. These boys were beaten by the guards with clubs and were tied to the ceilings with their arms tied so it was easier for the guards to club them. After five days of this, the boys were taken out of what they called the hole, but only for a short time. Their wrists were so swollen from insect bites and skin eruptions that the boys couldn't even put on their own jackets. After four months at Alcatraz, the four boys were transferred to Fort Levensworth in Kansas by six armed sergeants. This transfer took four days and five nights to reach their destination where they had to be chained together in pairs. Hostetler writes that, from the railway station to the military prison, they were marched on foot through the streets and prodded with bayonets. And get this, although the Hutterites were all handcuffed, they still managed to walk and hold their satchel in one hand and their Bible in the other hand. When the four Hutterites arrived at Fort Leavenworth, they were given their prison clothes and stood outside in the cold, getting chilled to the bone. This, combined with the accumulation of months of abuse and inhumane treatment, caused Joseph and Michael Hoffer to collapse. They were both taken to the hospital, while the remaining two, Jacob Whipp and David Hoffer, were sent off to solitary confinement on a starvation diet, like the one they had been on at Alcatraz. After Joseph and Michael had been hospitalized, 
Jacob had managed to send off a telegram to tell their wives, who boarded the earliest train to Leavenworth, Kansas. Now, unfortunately, there was a lot of confusion over which fort this telegram had come from. The station agent insisted to the wives of Joseph and Michael that the telegram had in fact come from Fort Riley rather than Fort Leavenworth. So the women had gotten train tickets to the wrong destination, which ended up costing them an extra day of travel. Finally, the women arrived at Fort Leavenworth at midnight, and they found their husbands almost dead. And when the women returned the next morning on November 30th, Joseph Hoffer had died. The guards refused Joseph's wife, Maria, permission to see her dead husband's body. After begging the colonel to let her see him, the colonel finally relented and Maria was finally allowed to see the casket. But when Maria looked in her husband Joseph's casket, Maria saw him dressed up in the army uniform that he had so refused to wear all along. This must have been truly heartbreaking and was the ultimate sign of complete disrespect towards her husband Joseph and the Hutterian brethren. And then another tragedy happened. Two days later, on December 2nd, 1918, Michael Hoffer also died. These two grieving wives managed to bring their now dead husbands' bodies back to the Hutterite colony in South Dakota, where a gigantic funeral was being held, reminding every single Hutterite of the true cost of living out their true Hutterian faith. Thankfully, David Hoffer was released from prison one month later, on January 2nd, 1919, and Jacob Whiff was also released from prison a few months later on April 13th, 1919. In the year 1918, 16 new Hutterite colonies were founded in Canada, and this abrupt decision to move north was undoubtedly the result of their treatment during World War I. However, what happened to the Hutterites while in prison was not the only form of persecution that the Hutterites had undergone during America's involvement in World War I. The Hutterites and their colonies in South Dakota were also subjected to lots of harassment, lies in the media, and attacks. Now, it's true that this was the case for all German-speaking people. However, it was particularly true for the Hutterites, who lived in isolated, separated colonies, and therefore were very easy for the media to make a villain out of. The media accused the Hutterites of being cowards, Kaiser supporters, and pro-German. The media condemned the Hutterites for their lack of patriotism because they refused to buy liberty bonds, while conveniently leaving out that the Hutterites were instead contributing money to the relief of war suffering. But nevertheless, a local bond committee in South Dakota assigned the Hutterites a quota of how much war bonds that they were required to buy. But the Hutterites refused. And on May 10, 1918, the newspaper Sinox Falls published a long article about how the Mennonites refused to purchase Liberty Bonds. It's important to know that the media usually referred to the Hutterites also as Mennonites, and you can see that in this case. If the Mennonites do not like the idea, let them pack up what they can carry away and return to that part of Europe where they came from. But this newspaper's propaganda about the Hutterites not contributing in their own ways worked and left many South Dakotans very angered at the Hutterite colonies. Some angry citizens traveled to the Jamesville colony and drove away a hundred steers and a thousand sheep where they were sold at a livestock auction with the proceeds being used to purchase Liberty Bonds. Then in June 1918, a group stole 82 gallons of wine from the Jamesville colony. John Unruh writes that it was commonly known that the Hutterites made wine from their wild grapes in the fall of the year, and stored it throughout the rest of the year for occasional medicinal and religious purposes. After some of the wine was stolen, the local officials then raided the Hutterites' colonies, confiscating all of their wine under the Prohibition Act. Later, in November 1918, another group of angry citizens raided a Hutterite wine cellar and brought the stolen wine back to the city where on the steps of the courthouse, this wine was freely distributed to the citizens during the Armament Day Parade in celebration for the ending of World War I. Interestingly enough, it is reported that even the mayor of the city, who later became a federal judge, appeared to be drunk from the wine. With these attacks on the colonies, as well as the drafted Hutterite boys who had been murdered, 
And not to mention the smear campaigns and lies propagated by the media, more and more Hutterites were leaving South Dakota and entering up north into Canada. And by the end of 1918, 16 Hutterite colonies had been founded in Canada, specifically in Alberta and Manitoba. Now, not all of these Hutterites stayed in Canada, as you can see from the modern-day Hutterite diaspora, where a third of all Hutterites live in the United States. But you'll have to wait for my Hutterite documentary to learn more about that, which I'll put right here once it's released. Thank you so much for watching this documentary. If you enjoy my work, please consider supporting my work on Patreon. By becoming a Patreon, I will respond to all of your questions through Patreon's direct messages. You will also get early access to all of my documentaries before they're released to the general public. But most importantly, you will be helping me produce higher quality and more frequent content in the future. I appreciate you for watching until the very end. Take care of yourself and always remember, you are beautiful and unique. Have a great rest of your day.